I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and a few weeks ago on my Patreon I put up a poll asking if people want me to start talking more about Irish folklore. And people voted that they did want that, so that's what I'm going to do. I started this already a little bit in my Halloween video about jack-o'-lanterns and the story of Stingy Jack. But I'm going to do more of it, and it's going to become more of a frequent thing. The story we're going over today is called The Lady of Gollerus, and it's my favourite story from Irish folklore. Not because it's got any, like, stirring social message, or because it has, like, any important moral or anything. In fact, morally, the story's kind of fucked. But there's just one line in it. You, you'll know it when it happens. I just love it. It's just... It's just perfect, and I love it. And that's why I love this story, because of that one line. Just that, just that one line. The Lady of Gollerus is a story about a marrow. A marrow is kind of like a halfway house between a mermaid and a selkie. Like a selkie, it can change back and forth between an aquatic form and a land-based form. And it does so by using an item of clothing. In the case of a marrow, it's a hat, or a cap called a Koholin Drip. The way that Marrow's difference from, differ from Selkies, though, is that they're not seal-like, they're fish-like, more like a mermaid. But unlike mermaids, they don't eat people. I believe Marrow's are basically just an Irish thing. I don't... I think there might be some Scottish stories about Marrow's, but they're mostly Irish. And honestly, the Scots are just the lads we sent to take over the top bit of England years and centuries ago. I'm gonna get in trouble for having said that. <laughs> so one day, in Smerwick Harbour in County Kerry, a fisherman named Dick Fitzgerald was standing by the beach, taking in the sunrise. And Dick, he was a lonely man. He didn't have much going on in his life. His parents were dead. He didn't have any brothers or sisters. He didn't have that many friends. There was no one in his life. He was very alone. He was very miserable. And he's standing there, by the beach, just pouring out his heart to this rock, or just a rock standing on the beach, because that's the only thing he has to talk to. And he says to the rock, to have the woman, it would not be this way with me. And what in the wide world is a man without a wife? He's no more surely than a bottle without a drop of drink in it, or dancing without music, or the left leg of a scissors, or a fishing line without a hook, or any other matter that is in no ways complete. Uh, ruminating on his loneliness and his misery, he glances down at the beach, and he sees a gorgeous woman sitting upon a rock, combing out her sea-green hair, which Dick thinks looks like melted butter upon cabbage, which is one of the most disgusting similes I have ever heard. That does not sound pleasant. Especially not to touch. And because of her hair, the colour of her hair, and the Kohaline Dre he sees lying next to her, he guesses that she must be a marrow. So he sneaks down to the beach and he steals the Kohaline Dre. Because without it, she can't go back into the sea, she can't go back to where she's from. And Dick, he feels sorry for her because he's got a soft heart, but he doesn't give it back because that would be nice. Instead, he says, don't cry, my darling. And he tries to talk to her. He tries to engage her in conversation, but she doesn't want to talk to this man who just stole from her. He doesn't, she doesn't want to talk to this man who just, you know, basically took what is an integral part of her life. I can't imagine why not. So instead, he squeezes her hand as Universal language, not, not a woman in the world, be she fish or lady, that does not understand it. When he squeezes her hand, he notices that her fingers are webbed. And while this is in no way unpleasant, it's very unusual. The webbing is like thin translucent porcelain. It's actually quite beautiful, even if it is a little bit odd. She turns to him and she says, Man, will you eat me? By all the red petticoats and check aprons between Dingle and Tralee, he exclaims in the most Irish fashion I have ever heard. I'd as soon eat myself, my Jew. 
is that I eat you, my pet. Now, twas some ugly, ill-looking thief of a fish put that notion into your own pretty head, with the nice green hair down upon it, that is so cleanly combed out this morning. Man, what will you do with me if you will not eat me? At this point, I'd like to address the fact that this story insists on treating the marrow, who never gets a name, as a fish. To the point that she is surprised Dick isn't going to eat her like he would with any other fish. Even Dick goes along with the idea that she is a fish and keeps addressing her as fish as the story progresses. I feel the need to address this now because this is the point of the story where Dick realizes how pretty this fish is and decides that he wants to fuck the person that he thinks of as a fish. But, of course, Dick is a good Christian, so he wants to marry her first. Fish, here's my word, fresh and fast in for you this blessed morning, that I'll make you Mistress Fitzgerald before the world, and that's what I'll do. The Marrow considers this for a moment, and says, Never say the word twice. I'm ready and willing to be yours, Mr. Fitzgerald, but stop if you please till I twist up my hair. So Dick, being the gracious person he is, waits patiently for the Marrow to tie up her hair instead of immediately jetting off to marry the woman he kidnapped. However, he sees her bend over and whisper into the waves. Is it speaking you are, my darling, to the salt water? It's nothing else. I'm just sending word home to my father not to be waiting breakfast for me, just to keep him from being uneasy in his mind. Dick asks who the Marrow's father is, and she tells him, it's the king under the waves. Oh yeah, look, I would love to tell you that at this point of the story, Aquaman, as played by Jason Momoa, erupts out of the ocean and kills the living fuck out of Dick Fitzgerald. And then the Marrow and her father, who is Aquaman, go back into the sea. And I don't know. I was going to say drink out of his skull, but they're already underwater, so I don't know. Do something with it. Put an electric eel in it so it can illuminate things. I, I don't fucking know. But instead, they have a conversation wherein it is established that the Marrow have no concept of financial wealth. And Dick decides to exploit this in order to get his hands on every piece of gold or treasure that ever sank to the bottom of the ocean. And this is where we come to the only other character in the entire story who gets a proper name. Dick takes the marrow from the town of Gollerus to the nearby town of Balin Running to get married by a priest named Father Fitzgibbon. Uh, Father Fitzgibbon, Father Fitzgibbon wasn't very approving of this interspecies marriage. He said, and is it a fishy woman you'd marry? The Lord preserve us! Send the scaly creature home to her own people! That's my advice to you, wherever she came from. Dick nearly does the right thing and gives the Kohaline drift back to the marrow and lets her get along with her life. But he reconsiders and tries to convince Father Fitzgibbon by telling her she's the daughter of a king and as mild and beautiful as the moon. But Father Fitzgibbon is unmoved. If she was the daughter of 50 kings, and as mild and as beautiful as the sun, moon and stars all put together, I tell you, Dick Fitzgerald, she you can't marry her, she being a fish. But then, Dick realised that he was dealing with a representative of the Irish Catholic Church, and he knew immediately what tack to take. But she has all the gold that's down in the sea only for the asking, and I'm a made man if I marry her, and I can make it worth anyone's while to do the job. And Father Fitzgibbon, he thinks about this and he says, Oh, that alters the case entirely! Why, there's some reason now in what you say. Why didn't you tell me this before? Marry her by all means if she was ten times a fish. Money, you know, is not to be refused in these bad times. And I may as well have the handsel of it as another. That maybe would not take half the pains in counselling you as I have done. So, suitably bribed, Father Fitzgibbon marries them both, and they go live together in Dick's cottage in the town of Gollerus. In three years, they have two boys and a girl, and they all appear to be living together very happily, with the marrow doing the cooking, the cleaning, and minding the children, because of course. 
the marrow has such good manners and has such a noble bearing that she became very well loved in the town of Goleris. Everyone thought she was great and everyone thought she was so beautiful and noble that she was referred to as the Lady of Goleris. But one day Dick had to go to Tralee on business. So he takes the day and he heads off to Tralee and he leaves his wife to cook and clean and to take care of the kids. And while she's cleaning she dislodges one of Dick's fishing nets and watch her fall out from behind it, but her Colleen drip. And she picks it up. And this is where I disagree with what the story says. Because the story says is she picks it up and she thinks, Oh, well, it's been such a long time since I've seen my father and my siblings. And sure, Dick, he, I love Dick and I love the kids. And he wouldn't begrudge me a visit. He wouldn't begrudge me a visit, no. It'll be fine, it'll be grand, I'll be back this evening. But she's never heard from again. And the story says that when she got into the waves, she forgot. She forgot all about her life on land and it all just completely vanished out of her mind. But I think she just wanted to get shot at Dick Fitzgerald. Get shot at that bastard who kidnapped her by essentially holding a part of her body ransom. Or else maybe I'm just over-interpreting a very old folk tale. That was The Lady of Goleris. It's one of my favourite Irish folk stories, purely because of the line, you can't marry her, she be in a fish. Because that's just perfect. I wish somebody had said that in The Little Mermaid. That would have been fantastic. I'm going to be doing more of these, and if you would like to have more influence over the kind of videos I make, then sign up for my Patreon, like these fine people in wherever I'm putting that in comparison. Uh, this might even just be a voiceover at this point, I don't know. I'm not editing this right now, future me is deciding this. But <laughs> you could be one of my patrons like Neil McConvera and any of the other people in the boxy thing where the names of the other patrons are going to be. Yeah. But if you don't feel like you can be a patron, if you haven't got the cash, that's fine, I understand. I am also poor. If you um, just want to support my work, a like goes a long way. Comments go a long way. Even negative comments go a long way. And remember, your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.